are you in uh, 1 Corinthians 15? 1 Corinthians 15. We're talking about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. And in so doing, it assures that every sin was paid for by Christ's death and shed blood. I hope you understand that. How in the world does resurrection prove that every sin was paid for? I'll tell you why. Because God's answer to his satisfaction is the resurrection. The Bible, that's true. Now think about that. God's answer to his satisfaction is the resurrection. The proof is resurrection. That all of our sins have been taken care of. The Bible says in Isaiah 53 that it pleased God to bruise Christ. It pleased God to bruise Christ. Verse 10. Verse 11, God saw the, the travail of Christ's soul and was satisfied. How do I know he's satisfied? The resurrection. That's how I know he's satisfied. Sin's paid for. He rose again without sin. Sin has been paid for. The sin debt has been paid for and he's sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high. God's demands were fully met and the work of redemption indeed is finished. Redemption, purchase. God purchased the world on the cross of Calvary. We don't need to be redeemed. We need to be regenerated. Quicken. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. We preach the word of God. Uh, you hear the word of God. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We believe God. The spirit of God regenerates that soul, makes us a brand new creature. Is what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 14 and also verse 17 as well. All right, so the love that only Christ can shed. So his demands were fully met. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 1 verse 4, declared to be the son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now we know back at Calvary, God's attitude and attributes and character were on full display. Full display. We see, we see the compassion, we see the concern, we see the loving kindness, we see mercy, we see grace, we see long suffering, we see everything concerning God there on the cross of Calvary. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the answer. His answer to his satisfaction, of course, too, is the resurrection. Now, last Sunday, we looked at the proofs of the resurrection in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15 and uh, the first four verses. First proof, you remember, and I'm just briefly reviewing, the first proof of a resurrection is salvation. Verse number one and two. The Bible said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, and which also ye have received, and wherein you stand, by which also ye are saved, if you keep in memory, uh, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. So the proof of salvation is, uh, the proof of the resurrection is salvation. I'm saved. Without the resurrection, no one could get saved. I'm saved. How don't you know I'm saved? Because the Bible says so. He declared me righteous the moment I believed him. And you know what happened at that point, that at regeneration, is he imputed the righteousness of his dear son to my account. And he did that to you if you're saved. If you're saved. If you're saved. That's the big question. Are you really saved? Are you going to heaven when you leave this world? I sure hope you are. So salvation is proof of a resurrection. Not only that, but verse 3 and 4, the Old Testament scriptures are a proof of resurrection. Amen? He preached, uh, if you'll notice in verse 3 and 4, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I, also, uh, which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scripture, and, how, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. The Old Testament is full of teachings concerning Christ, the Messiah, and his death and his resurrection. Psalmist speaks of it, thou shalt not leave my soul in hell. You can take the Old Testament and show someone Christ and they can be born again. Amen. You can, it's, and especially in Isaiah 53. What a graphic picture of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we have salvation as proof. We have the Old Testament scripture as proof. And if you'll notice in verse 5 through 11, he was seen. He was dead, so he was buried. He rose again, so he was seen. He was seen, and there were like 11 appearances. Uh, Paul doesn't name all 11, but he names sufficient amount for you to realize that people saw him and he, would, he was even seen above 500 brethren at one time. So we know that he is alive and he rose again. So we see the proofs of the resurrection. And then in verse number 12 and following, we see the importance of the resurrection. The Bible says in verse number 12, now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, 
How say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? <laughs> Evidently, some in the church were, were, uh, were of, of the unbelief, uh, of the persuasion of unbelieving the resurrection. If you'll notice, you can talk about Christ and people even will accept that. And they don't like to mention the name Jesus, but at least they'll accept teachings on Christ because they've heard it all of his life. But if you'll know all their life, but if you know, uh, if you notice when Paul began to preach Christ, it was all right until he got to the resurrection. Even there on Mars Hill in the book of Acts, when you started mentioning the resurrection, that's when they turned you off. Some believed and many went, there, went back the other way. But without the resurrection, there would be no salvation. So Paul preached a full gospel, a full gospel, the resurrection and he was seen. Those who taught against or didn't believe in the resurrection from the dead, they're in the church of Corinth and in so doing, they were leading many people astray. And that's why we're always cautious of being careful what you say, the importance of the words that you say. Be very careful, be very careful. Make sure when you're talking to someone about Christ that you use Bible words, you use Bible words. What the Bible has to say about salvation, who Christ is and what he did is sufficient. Uh, redemption is complete. Reconciliation has been made, that bringing together. Peace has been made by the blood of his cross. And when you tell people what Christ has already done, you don't have to force them to believe what you do is you keep telling them what happened and the Spirit of God will illuminate that mind and say, can't you see it's already done? Why don't you believe? Why don't you believe me and go to heaven? Simple as that. Not do anything. There's a big difference between done and do. Do, I'm still working on it. How, are you going to heaven? Well, I'm working on it. Well, I'm going to tell you, you're going to fail. I'm working on it. Done, it's already been done on the cross of Calvary. In order for you to get in on it, you need to believe him. Amen? Paul begins to settle the matter there in verse number 13, though. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? Oh, he's coming with a sermon now. Look at verse 14. And if Christ be not risen, then our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is in vain, is vain, and ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. That's terrible, isn't it? That's terrible. They're in the grave and they just rot and they go to the dust. They die like a dog. No hope whatsoever. That's terrible. That's terrible. We need hope. And Jesus Christ is our hope. All through the Bible, he tells us he is our hope. Our hope, our blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior. Then what's going to happen? The adoption to wit. What is that? The redemption of the body is going to happen. Now, by, the Bible goes on to say in verse 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men, <coughs> excuse me, most miserable. We are of all men most miserable. So people, <coughs> excuse me, people who deny call Christ a liar. And the Bible says in 1 John chapter number five and verse number nine, for if we, we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is what? is greater, greater. Romans chapter number three and verse number four. Yea, let God be true and every man a liar. Those that deny the very work of Christ, the redemption, the salvation, the resurrection, they're the liar, not Christ. We have a standard and Christ is always right. He's always true. He's always just. He always, he always in this book harmonizes himself. He never goes against the Word of God. He always does. If there's an apparent discrepancy in this book, it's your problem. It's not his. That's why he said, study to show thyself approved a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen. All right. So uh, people who deny uh, call Christ a liar and call. And by the way, not only are they calling Christ a liar, they're calling those who preach the true gospel a deceiver. And they're calling the Bible a farce. They're calling a, the Bible a book just to suppress man's potential. Did you know that's what some people are saying? This book is just to suppress your potential. My, my, it increases my potential. 
and it will yours as well if you get in it, amen? The Bible is the word of God. It's the very mind of God in print, the word made flesh displayed in print. To deny God's word is to deny very God, amen? And you don't wanna do that. Now, in chapter 15, beginning in verse number 14, the Bible again says, if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain. My, everything in our Christian religion stands or falls with a literal bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you have some religions out there, out way out in left field. Fact is, they've already left the ballpark, tell you the truth. Yeah, that says he was risen in spirit. My dear friend, Jesus was raised bodily. His body died as a man. He rose again with a glorified body. And 1 John chapter 3, verse 2 says, you're going to have one too. When you raise, when you're raised, we're going to be like Christ. So everything in our Christian religion stands or falls with the literal bodily resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Could it, could it be proved for one moment that Jesus Christ never rose, then the whole system of Christianity would crumble in the dust. It would go downhill. Your preaching is in vain. It's a sham without the resurrection. The gospel is not true. It's a farce. It's a lie without the resurrection. Your faith, the faith preaching produced is nothing but a sham without the resurrection. The apostles are liars, according to verse 15, without the resurrection. And you're still in your sin with no hope whatsoever. No present hope, my dear friend. I guarantee you, if there's no present hope, there'll be no future hope. Without the resurrection, man wouldn't have a leg to stand on. The apostles did preach the truth. The preaching, our preaching is not in vain. Why? Because of the resurrection. And that verse number 18, I've already commented on it. The body's still in the grave. They're going to stay there. They'll never be raised. Man, alive. If that's true, then I have no hope whatsoever. If that's true, you have no hope. If that, that, that's not true, yeah. You know, we laid my loved ones to rest, and I guess the one that hurt me the worst that I ever had to lay to rest was my mother. And... Uh, She's buried down toward Chattanooga, or up toward Chattanooga, not down, up toward Chattanooga. And um, I used to go to her graveside and just talk. People say, you're crazy. Well, that'd be all right. Nobody else saw me. <laughs> that'd be all right. And I'd tell her what was going on. Tell her the church is still going strong. I'd tell her, you, uh, your son's still preaching. I'd tell her things like that. But you know what? I'd talk to her like that, knowing she couldn't hear me. Now, I know good and well she couldn't hear me, but it made me feel good. But here's my hope. Here's my hope. I'll see her again. I'll see her again. You'll see your husband again, Miss Linda. Miss Faye, you'll see, you'll, see Rick, uh, you'll see Rick again. Yeah. See, we'll, we'll see Christ. Wonderful. That's the greatest part. But we're going to see our loved ones that's gone on. We do have a hope. Amen. If there's no hope, if there's no present hope, there is no future hope. And a man with no hope, you know what happens to him? Paranoia sits in. Everybody knows what that is. That's what the world's going to. The world is, par paranoia has sit in. Paranoia sit in, the world's gone crazy, and you're a part of it. Chapter 15, verse 19. If there is no hope. You are of all people most miserable, but there is hope. Christ Jesus, his death, his blood, and his resurrection is our hope now and is our hope eternally. Our hope is Christ. John 14, verse number six. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. And to reject him, to reject his substitutionary death and resurrection is to one day, listen to me, is to one day end up in the penitentiary of the damned and the insane forever and ever and ever in the lake of fire where the smoke of their torment goeth up forever and ever. You think we've seen insanity here. 
my dear friend, the, the penitentiary of the damned and insane forever and ever. You don't want to go there. It's, it's more than just burning with fire. You don't want to go there. Amen. I promise you that. Now, people are disillusioned and they're deluded concerning salvation and the glorious resurrection. I challenge anyone that is delusioned or deluded about the resurrection and salvation is that they just simply read Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11 is enough to convince anyone with any sense about Jesus Christ and his resurrection. Abraham said, hey, I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. Has, listen, doesn't have any foundation. The Bible said his builder and maker is God Almighty. He is the ultimate foundation. And everyone that went on in Hebrews chapter 11 in that great hall of faith talks about the Lord Jesus Christ and being with him. All right, so um, Christ is raised bodily, so are you. Now, you don't accept the former and you deny the latter. You don't accept the former that Christ was raised and then deny the latter. The latter is what? That I'm going to be raised. That you're going to be raised. As Christ was raised bodily, so will you be raised bodily. Bodily. One day. And how do I know that? Well, I'm going to show you something. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians 15, 51. Behold, I will show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We will be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. It's, it's going to be changed. I'm going to have a glorified body and so are you. So are you. Now the time of the resurrections, I, I'm not going to go in this morning and I will go in maybe later on tonight uh, with the times of the resurrections, but you have the first resurrection and you have the last resurrection. First resurrection entails not only your bodies being changed, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, the rapture of the church, uh, that uh, we're not, we don't have to sorrow as others which have no hope, 1 uh, Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 13. For if Jesus uh, died and rose again, even so them which uh, uh, are, are asleep will God bring with him. And he's going to bring with him. He's going to change us who are alive and remain. You'll find all that in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. I am going to be changed. I'm going to have a body like him. But then it goes a little further. And you say, and when I, when I say that, people say, well, what happens to you now? What happens to you now? Well, your loved ones that have died that are saved, the Bible says... Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, to be absent from the body is to be what? Be present with the Lord. You have a covering. It's not your glorified body, but you have a covering. You're in heaven now. You don't stay in the grave. The moment you die, Ecclesiastes 12 said, the spirit goes to God who gave it. It's what it says. So we know that. And we have a covering, a recognizable covering, but it's not until that day in 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 that we actually get our body like Christ. Now that's the first resurrection. The first resurrection, you go over to Revelation chapter 20, we'll dissect it a little bit more later on tonight. Um, first, uh, Revelation chapter number 20, the Bible said that the martyred tribulational saints and the Old Testament saints are risen there and then there's a thousand years and then after the thousand years, what happens? the resurrection of the damned of all lost people from Adam to the last man born all the resurrection of the damned are going to stand before the great white throne judgment uh, so these people that get up and say well uh, there's just going to be one general resurrection I've been to funerals and I've had priests and, and bishops and pro, uh, actually reside over the funeral and they wanted me to be a little part of it and so uh, and they would get up by the grave and they would give those people no hope whatsoever no hope whatsoever. But they would always mention a general resurrection. General resurrection at one time. That's not true. That's not true. I can show you in the Bible that at least a thousand years separate them. I can show you that. All right. Now, Christ is raised bodily, so are you raised bodily. In Romans chapter number 10, verse number 9, um, belief of a resurrection is essential for salvation. The Bible said in Romans chapter number 10, verse number 9, Believe in thine heart that God hath what? 
raised him from the dead, and thou shalt be saved. To preach the cross alone is not the gospel. To proclaim the substitutionary death is not the full story of salvation. The gospel can be no gospel without the resurrection. If there is no resurrection, Calvary is anything but good news. There has to be a resurrection. We preach the cross and the death of our wonderful Savior and then bury him and leave him in the tomb. My dear friend, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now, what fools, if that's true, what fools are we proved to be for warning men and women to prepare for the afterlife if there be no resurrection? Um, I'm quoting, I think it's M.R. DeHaan. I'm not sure. I believe I am right here. I wrote it down. Could it, be, uh, could it be proved for one moment that Jesus never rose? The whole system of Christian religion would crumble in the dust. The resurrection is the keynote and the arch of our Christian faith. Without it, all is vain. The modern practice of some who extol the wonderful life and teachings of Christ and exalt his death as a martyr and example of a noble cause and then deny his resurrection is a contradiction, a farce, and a paradox. If Christ did not arise from the dead, he was a poor, mistaken dupe or a deliberate imposter. How could we exalt and extol the life and death of such a one who claimed all this for himself if he was unable to make good his claims. My dear friend, he did make good his claims. Yes, he did. He rose again from the dead. He is alive and at the right hand of the Father and is our high priest interceding for us. Amen. All right, so we see the gospel of the resurrection. The proofs of the resurrection is salvation, the scripture, uh, uh, he was seen, and um, then we see the importance of the resurrection. Now looking at the order of the resurrection, the order of the resurrection. I don't know how far we'll get into this this morning, but we will finish it certainly tonight. Now the order of the resurrection, the Bible said in verse 20, but now, but now, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are, that are Christ's at his coming, then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom of God, even the Father, when, we shall have, when he shall have put down all rule and, and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. Let me quit reading right there. And the Bible talks about it in verse number 20, but now. But now here's the truth. Here's the enlightenment. Here's what you need. You do have hope. We have a blessed hope. We have assurance. We have a Savior. We do not preach vain. We talk to people about Christ and not in vain, we mention Christ all the time so that you can think about Christ, you can reason with him, get in the Bible and reason with him. So everything is not vain. We have a living Savior. He is God the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So verse 20 through 22, the res resurrection of Christ assures and guarantees the future resurrection of all men, both saved and unsaved. Saved and unsaved. The resurrection of all men. Now, verse number 21 speaks of Adam. Adam is the federal head of the human race, brought death, physical as well as spiritual. Death upon all men. Turn over to Romans chapter 5, if you will. Romans chapter 5, please. Romans chapter 5. Adam the head, the federal head. Romans chapter 5. The Bible says in verse 12, Wherefore is by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. So our first Adam, the first Adam, the father of us all, plunged the whole human race into sin. Now, and I'm going to read some more here in Romans 5, so don't leave Romans 5, but I do want to um, 
bring out something in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 47. The first man is of the earth, earthly. That's Adam, the first man of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. The Lord from heaven. Verse 49 of 1 Corinthians 15. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. So we have the second Adam called in 1 Corinthians 15, not only the second Adam, but the last Adam. He's telling us what the first Adam messed up in Romans 5, 12, that the second Adam fixed. The second Adam's got it all fixed up. Who is the second Adam? The Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now we're back in Romans chapter 5. And uh, the Bible goes on to say in verse 13, for until the law... Sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. What it is, the law just made sin exceeding sinful. The law magnified sin. The law let you know. That there was not a transgression until the law. There was sin, but there wasn't a transg transgression. Transgression is breaking the law. So now it's in the open. Everything's out in the open. Uh, even uh, them, okay, and we found that out to be true in verse number 14. Uh, not sin, similitude after Adam's transgression, who is a figure of him that was to come. Now, look at verse 15. But not as the offense, so also, so also is the free gift. For if through the offering of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus. In other words, the Bible says in verse 15, Christ's gift is greater than Adam's offense. Christ's gift is greater than Adam's offense. And then if you'll notice in verse 16, the Bible said, and not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. So the second thing we see right here is Christ's justification is greater than Adam's condemnation. Not just restoration, but justification as well. And then look at verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So the Christian life is greater than than Adam's reign of death. is what the Bible's saying in verse 17. Look at verse 18 and 19. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Christ's obedience is greater than Adam's disobedience. Simple as that. Aren't you glad that's true? You know, we've been preaching that God bruised Christ for our sins, and Jesus died that paid the penalty of the law for our sins, and now God is satisfied with that payment. And then we're reading here in the book of Romans, chapter number five, that Christ's obedience is greater than Adam's disobedience. Is that balancing, is, is, is that registering? Is, is that registering? He paid it all. If he paid it all and God is satisfied with the obedience of Christ, then what makes people think that they can add anything to the work of redemption? You can't. You can't. Again, there's a difference between do and done. Do and done. Did Christ do it all? Are we still, I mean, are, are we still doing something to gain audience with God? Or can we honestly say, based on the scripture, out of a, out of a, 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 a conviction that no, he has done it all. He has done it all. And so, 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, after we hear all these truths, and then God putting his stamp of approval on the work of Christ with the resurrection. Proved to be the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. Be here tonight. We're going to look at a little bit more of 1 Corinthians 15.